Uh, my name is Erica Johnston. I serve as the Assistant Director of Career Development here in the College of Education and Human Development. Um, and in this spring 2021 series, we, um, our, our professional experiences team decided to roll out um, this idea where we basically highlight three different career paths and sort of explore them a little bit more broadly um, each semester. So tonight's focus will be on teaching English in the US and abroad. Um, so we do have some Temple University faculty here with us that can kind of talk a little bit about some of our programs for anyone who may be interested in adding on a certificate or perhaps exploring a graduate degree. And then we have seven really fantastic panelists from a wide variety of career and professional and academic contexts to also talk about you know, how this degree could be applied into the field. Okay. All right, so I'll be presenting two more very brief slides, introducing myself, introducing our Temple faculty, and introducing our panelists. Then I will pull the slides down, and I will really yield the floor to all of our student alumni guests that are here today. So you can either unmute yourselves and direct a question um, to one particular panelist, or unmute yourselves um, and sort of direct a question broadly. And then whoever thinks that they may be able to answer that can feel free to do so. And as I mentioned before, you can also um, add the questions into the chat. So we'll have about 55 minutes to sort of engage in an authentic dialogue to sort of discuss a little bit about this field. So again, my name is Erica Johnston. I serve as the Assistant Director of Career Development. And it's my pleasure to also introduce Drs. Uh, Jill Swavely and Elvis Wagner, who are also on the line. If you'd like to introduce yourselves for a moment. Sure. Hi, I'm Jill Swavely. I'm faculty in the TESOL program, and I coordinate the ESL certificate program. That's a credential for folks who want to be public school ESL teachers, and I co-coordinate the TESOL master's program. Hi, I'm Elvis Wagner. I'm an associate professor um, in the TESOL program. I'm also the world languages coordinator, and I'm the coordinator of the Applied Linguistics strand of the PhD in education in the college. Um, I used to be the coordinator of the ELT certificate, um, so I know a lot about that. There's both a graduate and undergraduate, so um, I presume some of you, that's what you're interested in. So um, I can answer questions about that as well. So well we, already, we already have an ELT related question, Elvis, so that's okay. great to have you on the line. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so it's my pleasure. Um, I should also say as a Temple TESOL alumna myself, many of the panelists that are here tonight are friends and colleagues of mine. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be working together and to kind of have both of my worlds collide in this way. So we have Dr. Lin Lin Wong to start. She just defended her dissertation on Friday and is now Dr. Wong. Um, so she just defended her dissertation, as I mentioned on Friday, earned her PhD in applied linguistics, um, and is currently an adjunct assistant professor at Lehigh University and will be teaching at the University of Pennsylvania and Montgomery College as well this fall. We also have Sarah Rawls joining us today, who is at the end of her third year in the Applied Linguistics doctoral program, and her research interests include speech synthesis, intelligibility and listening, and is also, also interested in second language development, um, second language speaking and foreign language teaching, and teaches uh, language and society, and also does um, some tutoring with um, Chinese speakers as well. And I should also note that for any current graduate students on the line or prospective graduate students, Sarah and Lynn Lynn serve as co-chairs for um, the graduate um, students of language teaching um, student organization. So if you're interested, um, you can also feel free to reach out to them about that particular student org. We also have Katie Duffield on the line, um, who I did my undergraduate program with, and then our worlds recollided again some 10 years later. Um, she is also a full-time student in the Applied Linguistics T uh, program here in the TESOL department at Temple. She's not teaching this semester because, of course, she's focusing on her research, but will be um, teaching language and society and principles and practices for language teaching next year. So the three, the first sort of three panelists, if anyone has questions about um, the PhD track or more of the research and academic side of the field, they may be great um, consultants and people to sort of direct some of those questions to. And then we also have Marana Arafin, who's joining us today, um, who works in the Office of International Student Affairs, which is a two staff office that supports all of Temple's international students, um, serves about 3000 students from over 130 countries through the pre arrival transition assistance for new students, engagement opportunities, leadership, professionalism, advocacy, and also teaches a freshman seminar class as part of the global living and learning community. Um, Marina is a really great resource for those of you who are interested in seeing how you might apply skills from this degree into a more administrative role within higher education. 
We also have Michelle Ferguson joining us, who is the Education Access Coordinator at Highest Pennsylvania, which is a really fantastic community organization that supports refugee asylee um, populations as well as undocumented folks as well um, and supports the high school students. So she's a great person to ask about community education and sort of the nonprofit sphere. And then we also have Ala Lyshenko, who I completed my TESOL program with. Um, Ala is uh, completed her degree at Temple University in secondary English education um, and then went on to do the ESL certificate and the TESOL masters and is now an ESL teacher at Northeast High School and was just admitted into um, the University of Pennsylvania's educational linguistics program but is going to go on a deferral because she's having her third baby this year. Um, so I'll be a great person to kind of speak with around secondary education for English learners as well as the academic side of things. And we do also have Tim um, Tim Kern, um, who's joining us. Oh, I'm sorry, Ella. I'm using your maiden name. <laughs> Please see the correction in the chat for her married name. Thank you. Um, and we have Tim Kern joining us as well, who is a remote second grade uh, ESL teacher with a Montessori charter school. So anyone who's interested perhaps in the earlier grades, Tim would be a great person to ask about those um, pieces of career. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and yield the floor now to the many students and alumni that are on the line. Feel free to put a question in the chat, direct it to a particular person, or just put it in the chat and then our panelists can sort of um, speak as it relates to them. Okay, thanks for joining. Okay, Elvis, I have a question that might be um, really great for you to answer just to kind of get us started. We have some HDCE students that are on the line. Um, so if they were interested in sort of getting into the English language teaching field, could you explain a little bit about the ELT certificate and the ELT plus one? Yeah, who did you say the students? Erica, who did you say? HDCE that students. That oh, might HDCE, be okay. So the... Um, the English language teaching uh, certificate, and Jill, help me if I'm um, misrepresenting it, but it is, it's basically a program that um, it's not a major um, and it's not a, you know, a master's degree program either, but it's, it's basically a four degree certificate program, certificate meaning it is transcripted. So if you complete the four um, classes in the program, when you graduate, it'll have, you know, ELT certificate. Um, it does not mean you get you're certified to teach K through 12 or anything like that. So there's always the certificate certification issue. But so this is not for cert, uh, K through 12 certification. All it is is it's four classes related to language learning and language teaching, um, and it is transcripted. And so you know it'll have it on your on your um, transcript, and it's just sort of an introduction to teaching. Um, you know, if, if you if you decide to uh, if you want to teach uh, like a volunteer or teach individual ESL classes in Philly or in the U.S., um, you don't necessarily need official um, you know training. You don't necessarily need a master's degree, but having some sort of training is good, and so that that gives you a leg up. Also, if you're going to go abroad, you know you can also get a lot of uh, ESL EFL teaching EFL teaching experience abroad. But again, having some sort of training and documentation of that training um, really sort of gives you a wake up. So th these are nice programs. There are four classes that you can take. And many people take some of these classes and they sort of get hooked and then they um, want to continue on and get the master's degree, which is often what we're trying to, to um, encourage people to do. So it's, it's four sort of really interesting classes about language learning, language teaching, um, language acquisition. Um, and that's that's it. So I I really recommend you know, and we have if you want to answer questions about it. Oh, D is here also, so he is the ELT coordinator, um, so he can also uh, correct any mistakes I made. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I'm I'm a little bit late to my uh, previous meeting. Um, ran into this a little bit. So um, yeah. So any questions about the the um, ELT certificate program? I think we're good. So if you have any questions, um, I'll, 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 I'll be looking at the, the chat and feel free to put your questions in the chat. All right. So just to reiterate, um, the ELT certificate is a nice program to pursue if you're interested in um, 
learning more about the field, getting a specialization in education, um, and maybe you're not ready to commit to a full master's degree. Um, and this is something you can start while you're an undergraduate. Um, if you don't finish the four courses before you graduate, it won't hold you up. You can, um, you can finish it, you can come back and as a non-matriculated graduate student and finish the program. Um, the courses prepare you for working with adults or teaching abroad. Um, so again, if, if you're interested in the field, but you're not interested in being a public school teacher, if you're interested in teaching adults, um, then this could be a good program for you. There's a follow-up question in the chat, Jill, that asks if there's requirements for the ELT program and is it, does it exclude certain majors? No, there are no requirements. Students can join the program from any major. Uh, doesn't matter what your major is, doesn't have to be education related even. Um, and it, yeah, so it's not exclusive to certain majors at all. And there are no prerequisites. And um, just wanna just wanna add to that. So we we don't have prerequisites because um, we feel like creating a diverse community is actually going to benefit all our students. Um, and sometimes we had um, students. Um, so for example, um, one of the students that we had, um, she had years of experience working at law firm, and um, she is interested in um, you know. English language teaching, um, and and she actually uh, prospered in, in in the program. So um, we would like to build a really diverse um, community in which uh, you not only learn from the professors, the faculty members, but also um, each of your fellow your your peers. Um, so so it's really a learning community that we are trying to. Um, create. So I, I would encourage everyone to uh, who are interested in English language teaching to submit an application and we will, um, uh, all the faculty and uh, uh, our department will, will, will review it holistically and we'll make um, recommendations, um, you know, uh, based on our knowledge and everything. So one, uh, an additional thing that's important to know and that, um, uh, if you're an HDCE major, you take you have to take education 4441. That's part of the undergraduate program. And I know of at least two people here who took that course with me. So if you're interested in the field of English language teaching, you only have three more courses to take as an undergrad. And um, Dr. Wagner did all, oh, I'm sorry, Jill. I was just going to say, um, Mike's uh, Mike Capaldi's question, and Mike, I think we've we've chatted quite a bit about the difference between the ELT and ESL certificate programs, um, and I I think that if you're I still if you're getting um, your secondary ed English major. Um, the ESL certificate is probably the better credential for you because that does count abroad. I also vaguely remember that we we had talked about you pursuing the ELT certificate anyway, even you know equipped with that knowledge. Um, I'll let Dr. Lu, Drs. Lou and Wagner also jump in to answer Michael's question. My personal opinion is that you should immediately complete it after graduation um, because it's much better to go on the job market with the ELT certificate. What do you think, Drs. Wagner and Lou, about Michael's question here? Well, one of the things is that, you know, teaching English, you know, secondary ed um, in the U.S. is very different from teaching English as a second or a foreign language, right? So it's, it's the, the, the pedagogy is different, the content is different. So, um, you know, it, obviously just, if you're a native English speaker, that does not really qualify you to become um, an English 
um, as a second language or English as a foreign language teacher, right? That you, you need training, you need to know how to do it. Um, even training in teaching English to L1 English speakers um, still doesn't make you really qualified to, you know, to, to teach people that are learning um, English as a, as a second or a foreign language. So um, it's, a, it's really a different sort of paradigm. So I, I would recommend doing it beforehand and having that training before you do it. I'll also connect here, um, Katie, Limlin, and Sarah um, are three panelists who I know have taught in Spain and in China. So if any of you could kind of speak to some of those experiences um, as well, I think that might be helpful for students. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Limlin, Dr. Wong. Um, so I'll lead off with uh, John Michael's question. And it's about the expected qualifications for teaching English in other countries. And if it's country dependent, and just in my experience, um, I've taught in primarily in Spain, but also in China. It's, I would say that it's country dependent, but I would also say it's job dependent. <laughs> so a very common thing in Europe, for example, is uh, language schools, which are schools that are dedicated solely to teaching language, uh, whatever language that might be. The English schools in general are booming. <laughs> across Europe um, and they may or may not require that you have a TESOL background. For example, my background originally was not in TESOL, it was in teaching Spanish as a foreign language, but there was a lot of overlap in a lot of the pedagogy. It wasn't identical, but there was overlap. And then I got my master's in applied linguistics and really honed those skills as well. Um, so I would say it really does depend on where you are and what the expectations are. Yeah, and I completely agree. I also have a, a few friends who completed either certificates or uh, master degrees here, and then they went back to China and found very good jobs teaching English there. Uh, and to add on to what Katie said, I think at least in China, the job market for English teachers and other languages are booming. And we also have a very welcoming environment for um, teachers that speak other than Chinese language. So. Uh, I think that would be also tied to Schaefer's question um, because Michelle, Sarah, Katie, and I actually went back to China two years ago teaching at a college and actually it, they didn't need to speak Chinese at all. And I think it was very beneficial uh, for the students as well to really connect with the teachers using English only without saying a lot of Chinese. Um, just to uh, add on to what Lily and Katie said, um, prior to coming to Temple, I was interested in teaching English in Japan, um, primarily because my undergraduate degree was in Asian studies, where I studied Japanese, and all my colleagues basically went to Japan to teach English. And so um, most of them didn't necessarily have prior um, instruction in teaching English, um, but what I know um, a lot of Japanese companies do ask for is having an undergraduate degree. Um, they do like native speakers, but you don't necessarily have to be a native English speaker. And a lot of them really like having some sort of certificate, specifically um, like 150 hour TESOL certificate. So um, it really depends, like Katie said, on the, the company, um, on the country, because the, um, the requirements vary. Yeah, and to address what some of the messages I just got and what Elva said, um, it, the more certifications you have, the better because the more prestigious schools you can apply to with more benefits and things like that. Um, someone also messaged me about the language assistant program. Um, I know they have that in a lot of different countries. I'm mostly familiar with the Southern European countries, uh, especially Spain. And in that case, you, to address another question, you do have to be a native speaker of English. Um, that is program specific, that is country specific, that is school specific. Some do not mind if you're not a native English speaker, several do. Um, and if you're applying for a language assistant teaching job, you don't need a background in education, you just need to be a native English speaker with a college degree, which is not what we love, but it is a foot in the door, so to speak. And then a lot, a lot of my friends who did those programs ended up getting TESOL certifications. 
And um, if I may, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more stories. Okay, and let's be very realistic right here, okay? So um, the first thing I wanna talk about is, is when you're looking for a job, right? So thank you everyone who talk a lot about this, but um, so when uh, the way that we design the program, it's, it's we, we thought about when you are trying to find a job in, in, in the market, right? Uh, either in the States or if you go to other countries. And a certificate is definitely a plus. But um, if you think about it, um, one of our students were, uh, was interested in um, working with Peace Corps, right? And, and, and they have a program in which they have volunteers and they send them um, to all different countries and teach English. If you don't have that certificate, what are you gonna say? What are you gonna put on your CV or resume to impress others and say, you know, I, I, I wanna work in this area. But if you have a certificate, you can say, you know, I've been interested in um, teaching English um, in other countries. Plus, all, all of our courses, um, we build in a practicum component. Uh, and these are these are not like a practicum course, but we'll we'll give you we'll offer you um, a lot of opportunities to practice your teaching skills. And 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 teaching is the next thing I want to talk about. So let's say you got a job offer, um, and and you go to a a different country, right? And you need to teach. What are you gonna do, right? You you need to know how to designed and lesson plans where to find these resources, activities, and, and maybe build up your curriculum, or maybe you were handed with the curriculum and you need to adapt it, right? I remember years ago when I was a novice teacher, somebody gave me a test book, right? What are you gonna do with that, right? So these are all knowledge or skills that we are going to prepare you for while you are in the program. And we're not just going to talk about these in a classroom. We're not going to say, okay, let's discuss how we are going to, um, how we're going to teach a class, what activities you're gonna use. We'll really um, provide you with, with opportunity of, uh, you know, building up your resume with lesson plans, with reflections, with, observation reports and you have a, a, a for example in 5614 you have a e-portfolio in which you can show employers or or other people um, your colleague or or, or uh, somebody else that you know i to showcase your your teaching skills um, and also you know after you know when you are in the program you'll be um you have a lot of opportunities um like uh Dr. Joe Swavely uh, coordinated and, and uh, supervised a, a program at Providence, at the Providence Centers. And that is a brilliant program that helped a lot of our students um, grew from novice teachers to um, lead teachers and eventually independent um, teachers that can really make an impact um, locally or internationally. And we have other um, collaborators and organizations, um, both locally and also internationally. So, so these are, are something that I, I would suggest that you consider, um, like when you are really looking for a job or when you are offered a job and you, you really need to go there and say you have 15 students to teach. And some, in some cases, in some countries, you may have 25 students or even 50 students to teach. What are you gonna do with that, right? So, so both areas, um, you know, credential and also knowledge and skills, both areas lead to, um, you know, earning the certificate early in your career life. I hope that's somewhat helpful. Very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Lu. Thank you. So it seems like some of the questions coming in so far around teaching abroad, um, 
so those are great. You can definitely keep those questions coming. We also have speakers on the line who represent community organizations or higher ed or secondary education or elementary education. So if there's any other questions about teaching English learners in those contexts, um, we also have alumni panelists that are here that are happy to talk about their experiences as well. Great, Michelle, that would be you. Can we speak about community education? Yeah, of course. Um, so I work at Highest Pennsylvania. Um, and as Erica mentioned, um, we are an organization that provides many services, including ESL, to refugees and immigrants. Um, so basically for community education, um, it's really fun because there's some standards, but often each program kind of determines their own policies. Um, working with adults is not something that I necessarily was, um, that, that I thought I was interested in doing, um, but I taught in our adult ESL class for a year. Um, and it was really, really wonderful to work with people who, you know, are older and are therefore really motivated to learn English. Um, and because they live here and are working on, you know, building their lives here, um, again, just adds to that motivation. Um, and it was really a very meaningful experience. Um, I think also kind of to address the question about like, if you need to speak the language of your students, when you're an ESL teacher in the States, there's no way that you can do that. Um, I had, you know, 10 or 12 languages at any given time last year, um, which is really cool and really exciting. Um, right now, I oversee like a high school mentoring program. Um, so I don't teach directly at the moment, but I host workshops and um, oversee like a college access program for immigrant and refugee students. Um, and I think the flexibility that you find in community education to like oversee a program like that, or, you know, kind of other possible programs um, is really nice and really, really unique. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. I, I also be remiss too. Ala is um, an ESL teacher at Northeast High School, which serves the largest population of English learners in the school district of Philadelphia, but she also serves as um, and has for the past two years as a co teacher for Providence Center um, that serves adult learners and parents and community members of Northeast. So, Ala, would you like to speak to that a little bit as well? Um, sure, yes. I mean, I guess to begin, um, you really need. Um, you really need to have a degree in uh, English education now in order to teach in, I, I think at any level, definitely at secondary level. I know that it used to be different. Um, many of the teachers actually were only certified, uh, only had ESL certification, but now it changed. So they had to get this secondary English education. So you have to be duly, duly certified, meaning that you probably will have to be an education major in order to in order to teach um, in high school, like I do, or um, you can just always, you know, kind of uh, pick a different route. There are many alternative um, programs that will uh, help you prepare as an educator, right? And they are shortened. And I know many teachers who actually did that, and they're fantastic. So even if you are not an education major, but you're kind of like thinking about it, uh, there are there is always a way if you already have a bachelor's degree. Um, so what else? And um, um, yeah, the AT, I've been teaching, actually, that's kind of like the highlight of my day. Um, I'll be teaching um, um, uh, the adult you know, night class in what an hour and a half. And I'm really looking forward to it. You know, some people think that it's, you know, it's kind of like an hour, it's too much, but it's really not. It's especially now when you just have to stay at home. And um, it's, you know, it's like, it's very different. It's very different to, uh, to work with adult students who actually, you know, kind of like want to learn, who don't have to be there. So, um, yeah, um, should I, I don't know, does anybody have um, questions? So there, there is one question, thank you, Ola. Mm -hmm. there, there is a question about moving from HDC into secondary education. Um, I'm sure that any of our faculty could kind of speak to that process, but if you're already pretty far along in your HDCE program, there are other pathways to certification and Dr. Swavely is sort of um, sharing some information um, as well. So there are other pathways and residency programs like Temple Teacher Residency Program is, is one and we have many other partners um, and as well as the master's degree here at Temple where if you received 
bachelor's degree and then ultimately decided you wanted to return for a certification program, you could. Um, so it, it would really depend sort of on where you are specifically in your program and if it's early on enough to maybe do that switch. Um, Jill Elvis D, I don't know if you have maybe, you know, maybe any other sage advice around um, eventually becoming certified. Um, I just, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, you're absolutely right. Erica, in everything that you said, um, a lot of it, Catherine, depends on how far along you are in your major. Um, if one option could be for you to enter uh, one of our, pl our one plus one program, if you're, I guess, a sophomore or if you're early on in your junior year, you, you probably still have time to do that. If you want to reach out to me, um, we can talk and I can put you in touch with the right person who can answer all of your questions if I can't answer all of them. I'm gonna put my email address in the chat because this is kind of a, it, it really depends. You know, there's not one answer. So I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Uh, you know, incidentally, anybody can feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but Catherine in particular, if you want to email me, we can find a time to talk. I should also add to that following this presentation as soon as it's generated along with the transcript, um, I will share um, the, the panelists email so that you could follow up maybe directly, um, of course, with more programmatic questions for faculty, and then maybe about particular career possibilities with one of our panelists or, or all of the panelists. Um, I see two other questions that many of you could answer around pros and cons or major differences between teaching <laughs> teaching adults and children. And I could go on for a very long time about this, but I yield the floor. <laughs> Both are fantastic. Both are fantastic. Oh yeah, I saw I saw that question right away, and I can tell, of course, from my experience uh, that uh, being a teacher uh, in high school, you it's if you have a family, it's really fantastic because you have um, teachers in the school district of Philadelphia and all the other school districts really, they have fantastic benefits. So, uh, and that extends to all of the family members. So I have this, you know, like I'm having like my third child now very soon and I don't have to pay for anything really. There is like, you know, when you're pregnant, you don't have uh, to pay any copay at all for anything, it's completely free. And um, the usual copay like for, you know, to go like to a doctor is just 20 bucks. So, I mean, from, you know, I guess it's, you know, it kind of like it speaks to many people, right? It's very important, especially if you are, you know, like thinking about getting married, like having a family later. So, and of course, um, uh, I thought uh, Providence pays very well, but it was, there are no, there are no uh, benefits, of course. And for most of the adult education programs, uh, there are no benefits. So um, that's, I guess, like a, you know, main con. <laughs> But uh, as a um, as an additional job, it's a uh, you know it's really fantastic to teach adults in the United States. Um, a lot of it depends on where you see yourself. You know, what do you do? You can you envision yourself in a school context, and you know, spending your career in an elementary school or middle school or high school. Um, or could you see yourself in maybe like a more low key, um, cause schools are not low key. <laughs> and I think that's an awesome element of schools. That's why I love K-12 schools, but um, um, it's, a, it, it, it's a lot. Um, teaching adults um, is very different kind of atmosphere. It's, it's more calm. Um, you know, that some of the pros and cons in terms of teaching that population are that you're teaching folks who have a lot on their plates. So you may or may not have a captive audience all the time. You know, you're teach, and I know this from trying to attend foreign language classes on my own as an adult. You know, it's something I want to do, but I have a lot of other things that are pulling on my time as well, and some are immediate. You face that with your students when you're teaching adults. Um, a lot of our graduates who have based their careers in teaching adults have duties in their jobs that go beyond just teaching in the classroom. They do trainings, um, they have administrative responsibilities. Um, and actually, in fact, Michelle, you could probably speak to that kind of thing. Do you wanna take a minute and talk about what your job responsibilities are like? 
Yeah, so um, it's worth noting that I, for the first year of my job, was more involved in the adult education realm um, and since have moved more into this high school realm, um, but again, in the community education side of things. Um, but in addition to the classroom hours that I was putting in, um, that was probably about half of my like full-time job responsibilities. And I will add like um, what Ala referred to about um, it being harder to find a job that's like salaried with benefits, working in community education or with adults, it is much harder, but they also do exist um, as long as kind of like what Jill said, you're willing to and are interested in doing programmatic things or taking on other um, kind of projects. No one on our team uh, like teaches in the classroom full time. Um, so in addition to teaching, um, I do trainings, as Jill mentioned, um, I am part of a professional development project with the school district, actually. So we host trainings for non-instructional staff, so counselors, deans, security staff, um, secretaries about how to work with and welcome multilingual students and families. Um, I do a lot of educational case management support. So for example, we have some um, students who are English learners, but they also have an IEP. And so they have a case manager at highest um, who helps their family with different things. And as it relates to education, I'll be involved in that case. I might go to an IEP meeting or I might just help a student kind of navigate school, high school, especially now um, in the virtual world, it's really hard, um, things like that. Um, yeah, and kind of lots of different events and workshops and all of that sort of stuff. That's really helpful, Michelle. I'd also like to loop in Tim here, who is um, an, uh, an ELD teacher at the second grade level, and Miranda as well, who supports international students at the higher education level, not necessarily with direct teaching, but I think there are sort of two complementary bookends as well that can talk about working with the little ones and can talk about working with more college age students as well. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> Little late was coming from work, uh, coming from a meeting. So I am. Uh, with Zoom, my job has changed. I used to be an elementary school teacher that did first and second grade together. It's a Montessori charter school. With now things being online, I am just a second grade teacher. So first time to actually teach one grade at a time. So that's been fun. Um, and then I'm the ESL, ESL teacher at my school slash sort of coordinator, only person that does anything with it because we've only got four kids in the school. Um, but I've worked with different ages from kindergartners, the oldest, I want to say it was like sixth grade. Um, normally, well, I guess I've had all different kinds of populations. Um, there have been some students, like I have one now who he came to America, I want to say last year, and like his father cannot, uh, can't read Spanish, let alone speak English nor read English. So he's a student where it's a whole different set of challenges because of the like less support that is available at home. Um, but then I've run into other students, uh, one from Ethiopia who came over, who reminded me of when I taught English in Japan. He's a student that has studied English but doesn't have the, the, the fluency built up with it. Um, so you, you will run into various different levels of students, different needs, um, and I think also I think like what Michelle was saying and some others that you end up wearing a couple different hats. Um, I'm in a charter school that might be a little different. I think if you were in a district, it might be very delineated of who does what. Um, but for me, it's like, for example, ordering yearly tests called WIDA access tests. Like I have to order it. I have to corral it, get it together, talk to the tech person about updating it, all of that. Um, while also trying to make time within teaching as a full-time teacher as well. Um, yeah. I stay busy, um, but I have worked, I taught English in Japan for four and a half years at conversation school, so teaching with adults and children, um, and for the different levels, it, I mean, it, it just depends on your situation. You have adults with a lot on their plates or what they're comfortable doing. They might be a little shy or they're just exhausted, or at least in my situations where they were studying because a job basically made them do it, and then you have kids that are, you know, they're just there to have a good time. So it's a totally different level um, of what's going on. And uh, I think like what Jill was saying with like the energy level, adults are gonna be way more laid back. The kids are coming at you. They are even on a tired day, they somehow have more energy. I don't know how that works, but they do. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered something. 
Hi, um, I'm Marena. So I, <clears throat> I work in the Office of International Student Affairs. And um, while I don't teach English directly, my background is in TESOL. Um, and I have, um, for my field work, actually worked with adults um, <clears throat> Uh, mostly actually I've never I've never taught um, any anyone younger than that um, but currently I teach the um, first year I put that in the <laughs> chat earlier that I, I teach the uh, first year <clears throat> seminar class um, that falls under the global living and learning community um, so basically what that is is um, all our new incoming students um, both domestic and international students are part of this class and um, I love it. So I love <laughs> working with college students. I think one of the benefits of working um, with adults in general is that <clears throat> you really can get um, an idea of where everyone's, you know, uh, motivation is coming from to to learn and um, you know having these discussions with them, you're able to figure out okay what works um, in terms of <clears throat> their learning styles. Um, Whereas I think that's a little bit harder, in my opinion, I think if you wanted to get that out of children, they won't be able to articulate that as well. Um, but yeah, I, um, you know, and for me, my the population that I serve um, at Temple are mostly with international students. So um, international students come in with, you know, a wealth of different experiences, you know, coming from all these different countries. And then they're in this one classroom and they can, you know, to have that ability to share that with other students, um, to me is, is always a, a great um, experience, no matter, you know, what, what you're teaching. So that I, uh, I, I really enjoy every time and, and every class I have is, is always different. So I feel like I'm learning a lot from, um, you know, our students in, in general. Thank you, Tim and Marina. Um, and if I could also just advocate for the International Student Affairs Office, um, they run a lot of programming that is for international students. Um, but if and when we return to campus, it's not exclusive to international students. So those of you who want to kind of go to one of their coffee hours that highlights Japanese culture, um, it, they're really, really fantastic opportunities for you to just meet with and, you know, um, kind of blur that line between the international student populations on Temple's campus with some of the sort of so-called native um, native born speakers that that you may identify as. Um, so Miranda, Miranda is a two, two, uh, two woman team. They do great work. Um, and I'm happy to share all of those events for the remainder of the spring and then in coming academic years. Um, there is a couple, another Thank question you. again. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure, Miranda, um, about teaching abroad. And, and I know the USTC program was six weeks. And then I heard Tim just mention he taught abroad for four and a half years. So I think that really um, sort of ranges. Um, and then I saw another question about the value. Is it, is it more helpful to experience wise to teach abroad before returning to teach in the States? Was there anything gained by teaching abroad? So um, I'll yield the floor to, to any of you who have taught abroad. Or Elvis, if you had something else you wanted to mention. Yeah, I was going to talk about that. So in some ways, that's the, um, it's a really tough question because a lot of people will go abroad and don't have any English teaching experience and they'll learn on the job, right? They'll sort of learn the hard way and they'll get a lot better and they'll get a lot more experience and they'll come back to the US or wherever and get training in it. And they, they have a huge advantage because they have that experience. They have that, they've learned a lot, you know, hands-on doing that. And that's a really good model. But it's not the best if when you first get there and don't know what the heck you're doing, it's not good for you, it's not good for your students. Um, so there's there's got to be sort of like, a, uh, you know, have some training here and then go and then you can really hone your craft. And then, if you, you know, after a while, often people will come back and then get a master's because they're really interested in, in continuing and, and getting much better. Um, so whether you go abroad first or afterwards I, I don't know but you know the, honestly that's why that, that's one of the really appealing things about teaching English is the ability to go abroad and get a decent job and, and you know see the world and um, and pay for it it's, it's a really nice thing one other thing I wanted to um, stress and this is related to this I was going to mention this is um, if, if you all are temple students you probably have seen all the emails about the, the Fulbright opportunities you know and temple just had the, the most number of Fulbrights they've ever had um, and many of our 
TESOL students or World Languages students do these Fulbrights. So, you know, you've heard of the Fulbright. It's a really prestigious program. And one of the programs within the Fulbright uh, fellowships is the English teaching assistant. Um, and so it's a real, it's a really prestigious, it's great on the CV. Um, you didn't get paid a lot of money, but they, they pay for everything. They've set you up. It's, it's a really good thing. Um, and having some teaching experience or some pedagogy makes you a much, um, you know, or classes makes you a much, much better candidate or because it's, it's competitive. It's very competitive. But if you have teaching experience and if you have training in how to do it, it really makes you a, a stronger candidate. So, um, you know, we really feed our, between the World Languages Program and the TESOL Program, we, we feed um, the, the Fulbright ETA the program at Temple. So remember that that's a really um, attractive, prestigious, great program to do. You can get, even if you have just some experience, then you can go there and then you really get a lot of good experience and, and a lot of opportunities then. I can add on to what Elva said as someone who started abroad. <laughs> um, so I actually, like I said before, I did my teacher training at Temple for my bachelor's in Spanish education. So when they assigned me the role of teacher or language assistant, so I was constantly in the classroom, constantly collaborating with other teachers and things like that. I really had a sense of what I was doing because I'd gone through the field work process, gone through student teaching, all of these things, felt very prepared. However, other people who did not have an education background that were thrown in front of the classroom had a bit of a um, panic mode um, because they were not familiar with classroom management, how to engage with students, how to modify speech <laughs> so that your students can understand you, all of these kinds of things. It doesn't mean you can't learn as you go, but I would argue that having a little bit of extra confidence that things will be more familiar to, uh, to you really does go a long way. But I, I, you know, that being said, it could also inspire you to go back and get your ESL certification, which is typically what happens. I just wanna add as somebody who did the opposite um, and didn't start abroad, um, I've been as, uh, has, it's been referred to the China program that um, was offered, I believe one summer. Um, uh, I've done two like short term abroad programs and those were things that really um, kind of inspired me to choose this as a career path and then pursued my master's and have been working full time for two years. Um, so I think it's just, I personally have goals of teaching abroad rather than doing like a program or something, um, finding kind of like a <laughs> real job abroad, um, so to speak, um, in the next couple of years. So I just want to like kind of remind everyone that you know, it can work for your own path too. Um, even though there are like, you know, if you want to do it this way, this might be better. If you want to do it this way, this might be better. Whatever works for you um, is also really important. And it's never kind of too late to have one of those like long-term experiences abroad. Yeah, my experience abroad was actually um, more like the people that Katie was talking about. So just got, I guess I had the education degree, but just uh, what was mine, K to six at that point. Um, but coming in, it's it's a whole different animal. Because I mean, as you know, as much as little, like I did student teaching in kindergarten, but even working with a kindergartner, it's like, yeah, but they can say the word water, like that kind of a thing. When you get in and even if it's kids to adults where they really don't understand much of what you're saying, um, it, you know, it, it changes so much. You think you have the greatest lesson in the world and you realize they have no idea what I'm talking about and you've got to just completely switch it around. Um, I, I think even someone, I, I tried to message someone to tell them some of those things, but like learning the, you know, you, you can't use, for, or not you can't use, but be, be careful with using like phrasal verbs, different tenses, even more slang or higher, maybe not higher level, but just different forms of vocabulary that if they're not exposed to it, they don't know what it means. And parsing that out, figuring it out is like, that's a very high level fluency technique that I think it, at first we don't realize it. Um, but anybody going through, I guess, like the, the education, I guess that normal path for like teaching in America, think of it like reading a book 
you give the little kid a book and they can't make it through the first four words. You're like, okay, that book doesn't work. We got to try something else. It's that, that same level of getting used to kind of their cover level very quickly <laughs> and adjusting your speech to that level. Um, but uh, it was also a great experience to, to do all that and then come back and then with the classes with Joe, with Elvis to see like, oh, that's why the entire company structured the textbooks in that way. You can actually see how they've structured it, like to practice this, to practice that, to work on pronunciation. Um, that it's it, it's neat to kind of come back and do it and say, oh, that's that's why everything is like that. But overall, great experience. I I was in Japan. I loved it. That's really great insight. Uh, so we have. I think this might be a good place to kind of tie the bow on this really fantastic conversation. There's one programmatic question that Monica has asked around um, pursuing school counseling and TESOL maybe concurrently. Um, so maybe we can address that. And then the next question is really around this aha moment, right? So if we can maybe end with each of the panelists and even faculty sort of saying, what moment did you know you really, really wanted to be in this field, work with international students, work with multilingual learners? Um, what was that aha moment? So I think Jill, you maybe. Um, Oh, Elvis has already asked. Okay, great. You can do the ELT yeah. certificate while doing the school counseling program. Yeah, you certainly may, Monica. And it's it's great that you're here. So okay. Monica is another former student of mine, and I'm thrilled that, that she's interested in this. You would pursue the graduate version of the program. So that would mean that your course that you took with me, Education 4441, would not count. I believe, right? D, you're not sure, Elvis? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, I didn't think so. We can, D can double check. Dr. Liu can double check. He oversees the ELT program. Um, um, but uh, what Dr. Wagner said is right, that um, basically you go to your advisor and you have them add ELT, certificate as a concentration for you and you can work in the four courses as you're taking your as you're pursuing your counseling master's degree okay thank you you're welcome. I kind of like made a realization <laughs> as I currently work with the ESL um, high school students at Lower Marion oh. I realized that um, as an ESL student myself as much as I thought that I would really it wouldn't be as difficult for me only because I've experienced it my whole entire life. I'm still an ESL student. I consider myself, even though I'm like pretty good now, but it really, it makes, <laughs> it makes, um, it like, like who was it? Tim, I think said is really different. Um, when you're trying to speak to someone that speaks Russian and you're realizing that you're speaking too fast and you really have to slow down and, like the way you word things need to be a certain way. So I've realized that with working with high school students that speak predominantly Russian when I really thought it would come a little bit easier. So I decided to add on that cert as being a school counselor, I'm really going to need that. So that's a great idea. It's a great I, think, idea. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's even, even great for just dealing with with any of the parents so that you can kind of get their own level. Um, I mean, I've had parents where you, you'll talk to them and you can realize, all right, the understanding is way down here. So you've got to adjust how you do that. Um, so yeah, I think that'd be great. All right, four minutes worth of aha moments to close. And then I'll be sure to send out the recording and everyone's contact information following uh, first thing tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure if I actually had an aha moment. I think like teaching English has kind of been in the back of my head since like high school um, because I used to do like some online like um, English like correction and feedback through a website called Ling8, um, which is for language learners. And um, so, and I've done tutoring with like Spanish and Japanese over the years. And so um, I noticed that most of my colleagues in my Asian studies program went to teach English. And I was like, oh, I wanna teach abroad. Um, so I was like, but I don't feel prepared. I did like a, a certificate program. And I was like, I don't think this is quite enough. So I'm like, let me stay in school, get prepared, get more experience. And, um, and then once I started doing field work, I was like, 
I love this. So maybe maybe field work was my aha moment. <laughs> oh, also, um, if anyone wants to talk about the JET program, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I'm going to have to agree with Sarah. Uh, field work was my aha moment. Uh, when I was in my undergrad, uh, I had to take a required course on English language learners. And that was where my first lesson on second language acquisition did me in. That was it. And then when I was actually in ESL classes conducting field work, it was the best experience. And I never looked back. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Someone wanted to talk. <laughs> okay. Um, I think mine was mine was a little different in that I I knew that I had. So I, okay, let me kind of <laughs> go back a little bit. I came in, I came in as a international student actually to Temple. And so I myself, I was not a native speaker to English. Um, and so I, you know, went through the whole experience of, you know, learning English and, um, you know, coupled with being, uh, you know, an, an international student in a culture that I have never lived in before. Um, so all of that experience really kind of, I felt was very unique um, to me, and I was, I always wanted to meet and work with others who come from, you know, a similar background, and I've been drawn to that ever since. Um, I worked, I worked a little bit in, a, you know, different fields prior to this, but um, it always kind of came back to, you know, loving uh, the fact that I, I like being around people who come from different cultures, um, you know, language in general. Um, my mom was, um, <clears throat> she actually, did a lot of she spoke several languages but hers mainly being German um, did a lot of um, translation work when I was growing up so I've always been fascinated with linguistics so when it came to me deciding on what I wanted to do for my master's degree I <clears throat> TESOL was um, one of it that really kind of drew me in over everything else that's out there you know people are like do you an MBA do this and do all of that I'm so, well I'm not really drawn to that so um you know, when I went into it, I, I would say that the field work um, helped me to understand what teaching is like, because I came in with no teaching experience. Um, <clears throat> and then um, that, you know, having different, so I worked first with, um, for the Garces Foundation, so that's a little bit of some community work there. And then I um, taught uh, for a college class, so um, at Temple for the uh, intensive English um, English language program. And that really, um, that really kind of like stood out to me that was like, yes, I think I want to work in higher ed um, in this field, working with international students. And somehow, you know, while I was a grad student in the program, I took on a internship as well, working for the international office. And that really kind of like sealed the deal for me um, that I wanted to, you know, work with international students and fell sort of fell into this um, more in like the international education uh, field. It's not so, I, you know, it's funny because it's not, it's not in a traditional sense where you're um, teaching English, um, applying my TESOL, necessarily my TESOL um, um, background in, in this uh, field. But in many ways, I would say the TESOL has prepared me to work in this field because I, you know, when I deal with international students or parents, um, you know, understanding the, the issues that they're facing and or anticipating their needs or understanding, um, you know, when, when they're trying to communicate an issue with us, I feel like TESOL has really prepared me for that. So, um, so that's pretty much, and I love doing what I'm doing right now. So that pretty much was like my moment of like, yes, I think I want to stay in this for, for some time. Thank you, Marina and Sarah, both for sharing. Um, I'm also happy to stay on the line for a few more minutes, but just please know that each of our panelists and faculty speakers are very, very well connected to a number of nonprofit and community-based organizations that have been mentioned or familiar with different online teaching platforms or in charter schools, public schools, have taught abroad in numerous sort of durations, different countries. So we really have a nice variety represented. So if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or all of the panelists, or, you know, I can, if you have a particular question, I can redirect you to who I think might be the right person or people to sort of answer that moving forward. Um, but thank you all very, very much for joining us tonight.